this next group of theories, attempts to help us understand countries that have been colonized. That may sound kind of specialized, but most of the world has been colonized at one time or another. Broadly speaking, we can think of imperial projects as falling within two categories. Franchise colonialism, also known as extractive colonialism, and settler colonialism. Franchise colonialism is a good descriptive term. In a franchised company, each individual restaurant in the larger chain is staffed and run by people on the ground, local to the restaurant. But much of the profit goes to the larger corporation. In the same way, European colonial powers would often use native-born soldiers to control and police the colony, native-born indigenous people staffing lower levels of government administration. Thus, they franchised out the work of empire. Back to work. Unlike in settler colonial societies, where the settlers stay, in general, in these franchise colonial states, the colonial power ultimately leaves, moves out, is driven out. So the paradigm that best explains them, post-colonialism, looks at countries that are no longer under imperial control, countries that at least nominally now have independence, and it tries to understand how the political, cultural, an economic colonial legacy continues to affect the politics of that country today. Colonialism altered the trajectories of these countries profoundly, sometimes inadvertently, as a side effect of the colonizing country extracting resources, and sometimes quite deliberately as a strategy of social control. Here are a couple of quick examples. Let's consider how was England able to rule a colonial empire many times its size? India alone contained more than seven times as many people as did the mother country. Divide and rule has proved to be an effective strategy, but the consequences can be very long term. The British closely studied Indian history and picked through Hindu religious texts selectively, taking only what they found useful, and created and legally imposed the hierarchical oppressive caste system that still persists in India to this day. As terrible as this system has been for India, particularly for the lowest class, the Dalits. As devastating as it's been, the cultural changes imposed by the Belgians on their colonial possessions in East Africa have led to even more tragic results. On the basis of the pseudoscience of anthropometry, the Belgian rulers decided that the Tutsi ethnic group was genetically superior to the Hutus. The Belgians believed that the taller Tutsis were natural royalty, descended from one of the lost tribes of Israel. They gave the Tutsi preferential treatment access to more resources, and they allowed the Tutsi to rule over the Hutu majority. The Belgians reinforced the Tutsi monarchy, allowing them to govern in their stead. Under Belgian rule, the distinction between Tutsis and Hutus was legalized and codified. All citizens were required to carry an ID card designating their ethnicity. Tutsis received preferred access to resources, including education. In 1962, Rwanda gained independence. An election installed a Hutu-dominated government. Three decades of independence did nothing to soothe Tutsi-Hutu tensions. And in 1994, it broke out into widespread violence. More than three-quarters of a million Tutsis were murdered in cold blood. 
More were killed on both sides in the ensuing civil war, which destabilized the entire region. Post-colonial theorists are not saying that Belgium bears complete responsibility for this violence. They're not saying it was foreordained or that the immediate actors in Rwanda bear no moral culpability. But we do need to take the colonial legacy into account to understand the context that those on the scene were operating within. In settler colonialism, on the other hand, the settlers come to stay. In a very general form, people come from the colonizing country, from the mother country, usually one in Europe. They travel to a new territory, often one inhabited by people with darker skin. And the settlers build homes. They take up residence. They consider this now to be their country. There are certain dynamics that settler colonial societies tend to have. These societies portray the land as having previously been unoccupied, or that those who previously lived there were nomadic, making virtually no use of the land, or to the degree that they recognize that anyone was living there, they portray them as savages, enemies of civilization, someone that the women and children need to be protected from. Most indigenous peoples owned land collectively and practiced collective land management. The European settlers took it as an article of faith that unless land was privately owned, it could be assumed to be untended and unimproved. And by this definition, they could ignore the native land management completely. Additionally, there's a certain element of self-fulfilling prophecy. When people are pushed off the land over and over, almost by definition, they become nomadic. When people are hunted, virtually exterminated, they certainly are likely to fight, actions which can be portrayed as barbaric. By defining the land as unoccupied, or occupied only by those who are a blight upon the earth, settler colonialist ideology opens the way for its most horrifying tendency to expand till it takes over all available land even at the expense of the lives of indigenous peoples. Sometimes you will read somebody in the mainstream media saying this or that situation can not be settler colonialism because the settlers themselves were discriminated against in the place that they came from. But this is a misconception about the theory. There is nothing in the theory of settler colonialism that says the settlers are bad people who had easy lives. In fact, it is often the case that the settlers who are putting down roots in the colonized nation, it is often the case that they were themselves the victims of discrimination. You need look no further than our own country's history. The pilgrims and other settlers who came here from Europe really were fleeing religious discrimination. But to those already living in North America, whose land they took, and many of whom they killed, from their perspective, that made no difference. They were settlers. Many of those sent by the British to colonize Australia were convicts, prisoners. And given the kinds of crimes most had been convicted of, petty crimes, including being in debt, some for political crimes. It's quite reasonable to describe them as having been the victims of oppression at home. But again, from the perspective of those who'd already been living in Australia when the British first came, whose land they stole, whose culture they attempted to destroy, and most of whom they killed, from their vantage point, the British were settlers and intruders. While this criticism is misplaced, these are controversial theories and there are legitimate disagreements on how they apply to particular cases. Moreover, while they can inform our thinking about the present and future, 
they certainly don't give us clear-cut, simplistic answers as to what to do. I'm particularly interested in learning your reactions.